Um, thank you all for coming tonight. It's uh, a change of weather, and uh, we're all excited about herbs. And you think, well, why herbs at this time of the year? Um, this time of the year is great to talk about herbs because uh, it's going to get cold soon, and, and it'll give us time to uh, think about our, our property and think about things in time to um, mull around what we want. And then with the seminar, um, it'll get you encouraged and excited and maybe give you some new information to get you going on doing some fun things with your garden. And it doesn't have to be a, a big garden, or if you have a big plot, that's fine. It could be as simple as this little selection here. So we're going to cover a lot of different things. Um, so while you're uh, taking notes, I'd encourage you taking notes. Um, the, the program is both sides, so it's just not the one side. It's both sides, so we've got a full hour. I want to leave all the questions until the end, and because uh, we've got so many fun things to talk about. And like Jenny said, you can contact me if you uh, see a slide that you were jotting down information and you didn't get anything uh, from it, or you want to ask more questions, or if you even want a consultation. Um, I, I can do that for you as well. So um, anyway, while well, we're thinking about the winter that's coming up and uh, you know, be careful out there on the slippery ice, um, you know that slippery ice is similar to music, you know. Well, how so, you say? Well, it's if you don't see sharp, you'll be flat. So be careful out there in the wintertime as you're out and about. Oh, I know it's a groaner. But anyway, let's get going. All right. See if I can work this. And it actually works. Great. OK, here's our, our layout on, on what we're going to be talking about. Um, no occupation is so delightful to me as the culture of the earth and no culture comparable to that of the garden by Thomas Jefferson. Um, I'll have a few of these little quips, and I'm not going to read every one. You can, you can read it. If, if I read every slide, um, we'd be here all night, so we don't want that. Um, but anyway, we've got, um, whoops, we've got, oh, let me get used to this. We're going to talk about design, then companion planning, and the health benefits, preserving herbs, cooking with herbs, herbal crafts, and fun stuff. And then, you know, in part two, if you want to see a little bit more with just the condensed version of this, and a little bit more over at MOA, or the, MOA, the Museum of Wisconsin Art, um, which is now in our new cultural center, I guess, of West Bend. We have uh, MOA there um, on the uh, east side, and then Goa. So you want to go to MOA and see all the good stuff that, the, that they have to offer out there. It's wonderful. Um, so anyway, and then too, I put this here, as some of you from the Herb Society of America, show your hands, woohoo! And um, so they just had their 40th anniversary uh, in 2016, and so this actually is my herb garden. So I, I did this little ad, and I thought, well, I'll just put that picture in there and see how that works. Uh, so that's the introduction. Let's get moving along. And so... Um, Herb garden design is perhaps the most delightful uh, activities for the garden. And whether you have room for a large area or a small area or just a few pots, it's really, really beneficial. Um, herbs are highly sensual. Um, they, they appeal to all the senses, sight, um, sound, the bees buzzing, um, the smell of them, uh, the health benefits. So you might say herbs are kind of the universal superfood. Um, and it's just really, really a, a good thing to learn about them. Um, so, um, oops, I skipped a page here. Just a minute. Um, when considering the plan for your garden, you keep in mind the exposure, um, what your neighbor's yard looks like. You don't want anything too overpowering, and you want it to balance with your neighbors when you're considering a design. So position your, gar your garden in um, easy access to your kitchen or... <laughs> Um, an area that you'll easy access. I have uh, a garden that's just a few steps out of my kitchen, so I can run out there in the wintertime, push off the, the snow, and, and hello, and um, use um, the, the thyme, you know. So I, I get the herbs uh, that are perennial and, um, and have full access to it. So anyway, let's get into some details about design. 
Um, so anyway, designing the herb garden, um, an easy one. Um, what, how do you want to use them? Well, if you want to use them for culinary, or if you want to use them for medicinal, or for dyes, um, just have kind of a, a, a thought in mind. Um, the perfect place to grow them, um, most um, growing conditions uh, for herbs are, are sunny. There are some herbs, and then that requires like at least six hours of full sun. Um, some have, uh, they can tolerate some shade, like mint, mint and chives and parsley and some cilantro. Um, and so you have to consider that obviously. If you grow perennials, it's very, very similar to that. They have to have uh, certain conditions that they'll, they'll flourish. Many of the herbs are Mediterranean, so you don't want them overly wet. Um, lavender, for instance, I have been struggling with that guy for a while, but I'm determined, you know, so even if you know a lot about herbs, there's always one guy that just gives you a headache. And, but um, lavender, for one, is, is there's a trick. And after a few years of trying to experiment and having it su successful, um, I learned that their, their top roots or their, their crown really likes it dry. So keep that in mind when you want to grow the lavender. They, they Mediterranean, which is they like fast draining soil, which is true with most herbs. You have to watch the light and the, um, the watering. So you think, oh gosh, that sounds easy. But you know, it's, it's, it takes some time to get kind of the personality of the, of the plant. Um, the United States has the United States Department of Agriculture climate zones. And so, as most of you are familiar with that, um, we're in zone like four or five. Um, I like to find things in zone three, because <laughs> then I know that it might, might, might grow. Um, but, um, however, there, there might be some places in your yard that might be colder or might be um, warmer. So you might, you know, experiment with the different areas in your, in your yard. The soil, um, the right soil makes a, a difference. We kind of touched on that. Um, nice, fast-running soil. And then um, garden design ideas, right, at the bottom. And um, so you figure out, okay, do we want to make a culinary garden? Do we want to make a craft garden where we can do um, wreaths and different things. There's so many universal things that herbs have. They bring such delight to the home and to the senses and they're meditational and medicinal. So anyway, we'll move on to the next slide, which is um, a few more creative ideas. Um, is, does everybody hear me? It sounds like I'm really like mumbler. But anyway, is it okay? It's not too like bad. Okay. Um, here's just a couple of ideas. Here's just a wagon wheel and they divide um, the oops, divide the area into various different sections and you don't want them to be too tall otherwise you kind of lose that that circular shape so they're using lower um, lower growing herbs um, in this particular design the next one is a little bit more um, it more addresses the typical garden that you might see um, with the um, the, the wood frame here, which is nice because you're walking along and it uh, allows no weeds in there, so we don't like the weeds and this helps in that. Um, and then too, you don't have to bend down as far to get to your plants. Now this garden you can access from all directions, so you try to have the plants that are the tallest in the center, so you know, it's pretty obvious if you have plants that are on the outside, you're going to block the ones on the inside. And, you know, shade has a lot to do with it, too. So if you have the tall ones here, um, you want the ones to get the most sunlight on the outside, too, so everybody is happy with that. Um, okay, the next one. This is a little bit smaller, more contained. It looks like they have some espaliers for other, other plants other than herbs. Um, it really is attractive. And then they just have one garden plot, and you can see it doesn't have to be elaborate. You can have one simple uh, plot. You have a central um, idea right here in the center. It looks like a bay tree, and your various different herbs, whatever it might be. And when you're selecting the herbs, you want to make sure that um, what to what 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 herbs um, do I use the most of? What do I like to cook with? Um, Am I making Thanksgiving dinner, um, which is you know nice to have sage, which is great for the for the dressing, and so 
it's just so fun. Now this one is really cool. You can um, buy or make um, a four by four foot um, framework. Be sure it's not treated wood, wood of course. And then I have it so it's like six to eight inches deep and then put organic soil in it. So everything you, sh you do, sh you should really limit your amount of pesticides and herbicides and not a lot of her uh, bugs bother, bother the herbs. Um, but just a good uh, flushing with your, your hose is probably sufficient, but um, limit that because with anything, with our fruits and vegetables, I really admonish the, the organic if possible. And you can go to Outpost, and there's that's in Mequon. It's it's not too far of a drive. Um, our local stores do have sections for um, organic food, and you can look this up online um, to look at the top 12, 12, 12 that you um, really should go organic. Um, and then, um, okay, back to the design. You you get your your string and you space it 12 inches, and then you put the taller ones in the center and then the lower ones on the outside. And there you have a nice, tidy little garden for yourself. So it, uh, it's really a, a neat thing to have something that you have options for. Um, and then go into this one. Now, this one might appeal to the guy gardeners because, you know, pallets or, you know, they all have pallets with their wood and various different man things. And so you clean a pallet up, and you can plant your different herbs in, in there and mark them. And so it's do-it-yourself pallet herb garden. And um, so that's, that's a really fun idea. So when space is limited or small, um, container gardening can work really nice. Um, so there's no excuses why you can't grow herbs. And they're very easy, they're very wonderful. Um, and then when you're walking through the garden, you can you know, smell them and everything. It's, just, ah, it's just, just really nice. I've got a few unique herbs here. This one is a basil, and it's a sacred uh, Thai basil. It's, it's something great, very medicinal, very good for you. For, I use it for tea. Um, and there's a lot of different basils. There's a lot of different lavenders, too, believe it or not. This is a variegated lavender. And, uh, but for container gardening, back to that, here is, is a basic idea for, for container gardening. It, this is to look at your children far away. No, this is, this is for the center part of your, your columnar, um, either vase or whatever, but for a, um, oh, tip over. Um, for like a small patio herb garden. You take your strawberry pot, which I'll just set over it this way, and then um, people make the mistake of, okay, I'll just stuff it all with some good soil and stick my plants in there, and then water it. Well, what happens is the water will not in be in here evenly, so you just take a piece of PVC pipe, this is just like two inch piece, and you put a few holes in it, and you stick it down in the center, and then fill it with soil and put your plants in here, and then you just have this as your watering hole, and then all the holes will, you know, render the, the water so you get even nice, neat, clean watering instead of just a mess. When I first, years and years ago, I thought, oh, I'll just put the soil in there. I watered it, and, you know, it just got... Icky. So that's that's a little trick to you know make it a little bit more convenient for you and more efficient. And um, so we can pack some of these herbs around, um, so you can kind of get in the mood and smell and feel and touch. Um, most of you know to to rub the plants and smell your fingers, and you'll really see that oh, it's just amazing. I mean, how could a plant smell so? How could it smell so nice? And you know, you have your other plants in your yard, and they're just like leaves and stuff, and they're really like whatever. And but these are so dimensional. So I'll start. Um, this is a is your basic lavender. We can start here because the herb society here, if it's represented, can have first choice to do that. Um, and then this one is a orange spice thyme. When you don't find it every place. You find it at Nino Ridgeway's 
Yeah, she's a member of our herb society, and she has Bartail Farm. And over this uh, weekend, they had their apple fest, and so you just rub that, and ah, oh, it's so great. And uh, you know, you can, and then of course, this is chives. This is kind of a rogue in the garden. Um, it uh, will spread like a banshee. So when the flowers go, yay, flowers, let's cut them off. Because yeah. <laughs> those seeds will just spread and it'll be all over your garden. And unless you want that, you know, then that's okay. Um, here's oregano. And of course, that's really good. And a lot of different recipes that we'll look at later. And just feel free to get friendly with those herbs. They won't, they won't uh, bite or anything. They just love to be petted. So um, just rub them. This is sage. And so this is kind of our Thanksgiving herb. And we all are familiar with that. Um, growing fresh is so much better than dry. Even though I know everybody goes to the store and gets dried. Um, and there are certain um, companies that are better than others to get dried. Um, dried is good in a pinch, but you know what? You can dry your own herbs. Um, and it's really simple, and we'll talk about that um, as we go. Um, but let's move it along. Um, so clean and strategic resembles 17th century designs. So we have um, things here that are, as you can see, the photographer took it from above. So uh, the French kind of adapted this thought. Uh, first, because they wanted to show their power and control. That was the basic idea. So they have these uh, knot gardens and partiers um, to demonstrate all of that. And um, so the design was to be viewed from their castle so they can see, you know, what they, what they did and how nice it is. So um, let it be the view from your castle. Um, if you want to have something like like that, it's worth the effort. It's it takes some time to to groom and to to uh, trim and to you can see a lot of the you know the 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 different little guys here that you have to tr trim and groom. But it's very meditational, very relaxing. That can be your time to spend in the garden in the morning when the butterflies and the bees and everybody's out and the sun is just the air is great. Oh, it's it's really wonderful. Um, and here's another last idea, um, obviously, stepping stones. So this could be on the side of your south side of your house. Um, you need to walk through your, your garden, so might as well fill that extra space with something very functional. Um, and then, as we move on, we have this one. So there's a fun idea to get some landscape stone and make a spiral. So um, a lot of these ideas are time saving, um, space saving, and just really, really neat. So how do you start with that? You have the ideas and everything. Um, you create the designs by just getting some grid paper, getting your tape measure out. You figure out what kind of plants that you want, what kind of things that you're using it for. Um, and just go to town, you, you label them. Um, where you want what, and we have time over this long winter. Um, so, but create a master plan when you when you do it. So, your herb garden will have some consistency like this with the rest of your landscape. Because I've done designs and and they just want oh we just want the corner of this property done. And then when it comes to doing everything else that they want to do. Um, it doesn't quite jive. It's like putting Mediterranean furniture with contemporary. It's like they fight with each other. So you, you just want to make sure that everything uh, works well. Um, and, and you know, you don't have to have like a big square space. You can have a corner um, of the landscape. Um, and it doesn't have to be square um, or rectangular. You can have it like a corner garden, which works really pretty. So you've got a lot of aesthetics that you can have flexibility with. Now here's a garden that intermixes um, your herbs and your vegetables. So that's totally great, um, which leads us into companion planting, but we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But um, so whatever you choose, elaborate or simple or ultra simple, it's really nice to um, get affiliated and get familiar and use herbs in whatever you would like to use it for. Um, so enjoy your new herb garden. Now that you're all psyched up and you always all have good ideas, 
now get to it, right? And so, anyway, um, the best way uh, to garden is to put on a wide brim straw hat and some old clothes, and with a hole in one hand and a cold drink in the other, tell somebody else where to dig. So, I made it super easy for you now. There's no excuses. I wanna, I'm, I'm gonna email every one of you and make sure that you are now working on your garden. Um, so anyway, we've talked about other people's gardens. This is a garden that I designed, and to give you an ex a real-time example, not like it's somebody off in the distance that, you know. But this is, this is something I, oops, I did, I'll preview. And um, so it's helpful to get different, you know, magazine cutouts or pictures that you want to incorporate, so that way you can envision your garden as well as you go along um, and highlight it. This is just a garden that, um, that incorporates a lot of different things. It's about 1,700 square feet. Um, it's paths, so you can easily move through it. Um, there's a couple of benches, because if you're going on a bigger scale, you want to have like a vantage point to sit and relax, because you're going to be working you know, a lot in a big garden. So you want to you know, get your herbal tea and sit down and, and relax on a hot summer day for do that. Um, but now on to companion planting. So companion planting um, is, it's a science, it was good, I'm gonna get a drink before I like, you know. That's what happens when you talk too much. My husband knows that. So, um, so basil, uh, the companion plant is, you plant it with tomatoes, repels flies and mosquitoes other things you can certainly read and make notes on as far as medicinal things go. We, we have a um, disclaimer where, of course, um, there's many medicinal benefits, but we recommend consulting your physician before you do any of that. But um, these are so versatile. They come in different colors, like this is a variegated columnar basil, and there's a Thai basil. This is the sacred basil they used um, in temples in China, so that's why they call it sacred basil. Hundreds of wonderful uh, benefits, a um, lot of great recipes. And um, so I remember um, Pat Grayhead, she cracks me up. Um, she's, she's a member of the Herb Society, Herb, Herb Society of America, and uh, <laughs> she always says, plant uh, basil with tomatoes. You know what I'm gonna say? Because she said, it makes tomatoes feel sexy. <laughs> and so, okay. And so I planted it, and yeah, they they were more prolific. They seemed happier, so I don't know if it was in my head, but I thought, what the heck, you know? I'll try it. Yeah, they were walking around like this. And I thought, wow, these tomatoes, I can't believe it. And so though that's just what that is. And then we have chive, and then you plant it with carrots. A lot of the companion planting is for the benefit of both plants. It's either one will deter pets, or pests, it will maybe pets, um, and uh, will help the survival of everything all the way around. Because we, we don't want to use a lot of pesticides and herbicides and things, so anything that we can do to assist with that. So if we want to take some notes on the next several slides about um, some of the culinary uses that are like in the kitchen is located here, all the slides you can easily have your eye go to because they're all kind of situated with, in the garden. You plant with, with carrots in the kitchen, medicinal uses, and a little doodad about it at the top. Um, the next is dill, and you plant with cabbages. Keep away from carrots. I don't know what their problem is with each other, but apparently they're, you know, bad blood. I don't know. Um, and and they're... They're another one that's just an absolute must for, for everything in the garden. And this is actually a, a plant that's good for uh, butterflies, um, along with a lot of other different um, plants that are out there. Dill is one of them for the uh, yellow swallowtail. They like to, to put their, um, see their, their eggs on there and, you know, and so that's, that's nice. We want to perpetuate our pollinators and, and our friendly guys. Um, so when you're going through the different catalogs, I'll tell you the insider story with what they actually mean. So a favorite of birds, when you see that, it means to avoid planting near cars, sidewalks, or clotheslines. So grow is beautiful every year. You think, oh, okay, great. But what it really means is looks like roadkill for the foreseeable future. 
Zone five with protection is a variation on the phase Russian roulette. And may require support, means your daughter's engineering degree will finally pay off. Um, moisture loving means it's plants ideal for landscaping all of your, in all your bogs and swamps. Carefree refers to the plant's attitude rather than your workload. Uh, vigorous is code for has a Napoleonic compulsion to take over the world. So these are some fun things that truly are, you know, whatever that they are. Um, mint a plant in your cabbage and tomatoes. So then you have your basil and your mint, and they're all happy with each other. However, mint is kind of a rogue. I love it. It's great in teas and a lot of different other wonderful salads and recipes. But make sure that you contain it, because it just will love your garden. It, it moves rapidly through the garden and will take over, and you'll be ripping it out and feel kind of guilty when you do that, because it's like, oh, I grow this all this wonderful mint. but. It, it'll take over. So what I do is I either contain it in like um, concrete block or um, bury it in a pot or something so it doesn't go ballistic. Um, then there's oregano. It's, it's, this is a all happy-go-lucky guy, but he will spread as well. So make sure that you're containing that somewhat. Um, and I like to use a lot of these herbs um, in the design for um, understory or borders. Um, oregano is nice. It doesn't grow very tall. Some don't. Um, and then some versions of your thyme um, that doesn't grow very tall. So it's a nice border or trim. Um, and you can use it as nice ground cover too with some of them. Parsley, we're all familiar with that. And interesting, you plant your asparagus, corn, and tomatoes. So that's a popular herb, rosemary which is this guy. You plant your cabbage, beans, carrots, and sage. The is cabbage moth, bean beetles, and carrot fly. And then sage. Plant your rosemary, cabbage, and carrots away from cucumbers. The is cabbage moth, and carrot fly. So um, you can get the idea now that it, it really is mindful to keep, keep in mind the companions. Um, kind of like neighbors, you know, you move into a neighborhood and you always want to have things copacetic with your neighbors, so why not our herbs with our vegetables and other plants? Uh, thyme is a favorite, I've mentioned that a couple of times. You plant your cabbage, it seems like there's a theme here with cabbage. <laughs> I don't grow a lot of cabbage, um, but it's good, I love, I love cabbage. Um, and it's, of course, thyme has got a lot of benefits. Um, as well. Lavender is, is, is wonderful and I'm still trying to grow it. They, are keep, they keep coming up with more vigorous um, plants all the time and um, I, I, I have to get it down because lavender is a semi, semi tender, I think, in my opinion. Some people can grow lavender like anything um, but, you know, everybody has their plant that, you know, they want to work on, which is okay. Um, but it's a companion for a lot of flowers, like echinacea, aster, sedum, wild indigo, baby's breath, um, drought-tolerant uh, roses, um, once again with cabbage, um, and um, roses. It, it complements roses in many different ways. Um, but speaking of lavender, look at that. Isn't that fantastic? It's right in our neck of the woods, basically. It's up at Door County. And have, I mean, how many people have gone up to Door County to the lavender farm? Isn't it amazing up there? I've never gone, but I know that you guys have, and it's, I've got to get there. Um, but I have to make a plug for Door County. And, they, and here's just some more that I can send you this information if you want it, but there's some more uh, information on um, the companion planting. And, um, but then we move on to preserving. So preserving herbs, we're mainly going to talk about the drying and the freezing. You can put them into oils, making herb vinegars and also yummy butters too. But we'll primarily talk about the drying and freezing. Um, freezing method works best with um, many different types of herbs. Um, some are better fresh, like watercress, that one you really shouldn't do anything with um, as far as that goes, because um, it 
you know, it doesn't turn out. And with drying, you, you take your plant as if, you know, like rosemary, um, you take a bundle of it and you wrap it either in twine or um, a rubber band and you just hang it upside down and put it into a dry, uh, not very well lit because you don't want it to sun to dry it out prematurely, but just it has a good air, can, air circulation and things. And most herbs will be happy as, as a lark with that. I also have a drying um, tray that, that works, works nice there. So all year round, you can enjoy your own fresh herbs. Um, and with dried as opposed to fresh, there's a rule of thumb when you cook with it um, that since the, the herbs have all of their vital oils in them fresh, um, they require a lot more um, of the herb uh, three to one than uh, dried. So the dried, the oils have been decreased. So you are increased, I should say. Um, so they're more concentrated. So dry, you know, concentrates all of that. So um, the dry would take like one uh, teaspoon and the fresh would need one tablespoon. So when you're cooking, so you need a little bit more fresh then dry, you'd think it'd be the other way around, but it is not. Freezing, um, a good way to freeze your herbs is to chop them up, put them in ice cubes. Um, so simple. So all of this is really, you know, once you get into it, it's like, really? I, I thought this was more complicated than that, but it's once you get into it, it's really, really not. So, so now we move on to, uh, we just highlighted that. It's just really straightforward and basic. But the um, cooking with herbs is great. Um, <laughs> I love the stage advice. Yeah. Enjoy the sun travel you can. And then the other one says, eventually we'll end up in a recipe. So that's stage advice. Um, this, this magazine is really nice. Better Homes and Gardens. Been around forever. Tried and true. Um, so we'll use a lot of the information that we're seeing from cooking with fresh herbs um, from there. So basil. It has so many, uh, I just highlighted a couple, a lot of different varieties, and um, you can make pesto. I just made pesto the other day. If you need any basil, give me a call. I can give you a bucket load. I have, I, I use this Aristotle basil, and, it, and I get it from Nino Ridgeway, um, and she she has that if it's available for you, and you can make it into. I have a uh, like a 17th century park here, which you saw a little bit of the that garden picture, but um, so it's great for borders, and so I grow a lot of it. I like to grow it and and use it um, in my uh, pestos and things. So, but if you need some, let me know. It's all organic, um, and so here's a neat recipe: uh, tomato uh, basil tomato tart. And then this one is parsley, not for just a garnish, baby. Um, it, it's great for freshing the breath. So if, if you're cooking and you go to a restaurant or you go to a restaurant and you see parsley on the side, it kind of indicates that maybe parsley was used in that, in that uh, particular dish. Um, but anyway, it's, it's great for freshening the breath after you have the meal and it's got a lot of health benefits as well. Um, in this particular recipe, it's uh, do-it-yourself basic remolata. But there's, um, there's a couple of different varieties. There's the curly parsley, and then there's Italian flat leaf. Italian flat leaf is the one you want for, for cooking. The other one is more garnish. So cook with for cilantro, salsa sensation, and then some add a little cha-cha-cha. Cilantro is one of those that is just indispensable for salsa and um, guacamole. Some people, it's a weird thing with, with cilantro, um, some people say it, it tastes kind of soapy, and some people say, I don't know what you're talking about, it doesn't taste soapy. Something to do with it, it there's the only herb that I know that people get a kind of a funny like taste for it. I don't know if there's people that like, I don't like cilantro. I don't know what everybody's talking about because it tastes like soap to me. I'm one of fortunate. I, I don't have that, but it's just in some of our, I don't know, genetics. Um, so, but it generally is really, really good. And then thyme. And here's a really good recipe that is yummy. It's used in a mushroom dish and stuffed olives. Uh, it's a really versatile uh, herb. 
And then we have Rosemary. She was always a sweet gal. Oh, gal. I'm so punny. I... Ah, oh, jeez. Okay, uh, pork roast. Here's an example of rosemary and pork roast. And it also, if you're grilling, um, rosemary is really awesome to use because it takes some of the carcinogenic properties out of the grill and the charring and whatnot. So if you go to different restaurants, they will definitely have um, that in it just to balance it. And it, besides, it's, it tastes so good. Tarragon, it's... Oh, not gone. It's here to stay. Oh, my goodness. Peas may have some more. Oh, I, it must have been late when I wrote this. It's kind of corny. But um, anyway, we have lemon tarragon peas. Doesn't that sound really good? Kind of different. And then we move on to dill. And here's the dill. It's, it's a big thrill. Love dill. Now I have to say, I, I, I was working on this, and, and I had something for dill, and it was kind of silly, and my husband says, oh, I can do better than that. So I have to give credit to my husband. He came up with that little thing. And this is in deviled egg salad. And then we have mint. We're meant to be. Um, there's multiple uses from salads to pestos to teas. Um, we have oregano, great for Italian dishes. And uh, this one is baked egg plant fries. Um, and another plug for the Door, the Door County Fragrant Isle, um, they do have cooking classes. And so frequently they host cooking classes of what you guys know about. And they're awesome, right? The <sighs> yeah, right there in the field. I mean, you feel like what, you're in France or something. Yeah. So there's the there's the phone number if you want to call them and book a reservation and check that out. So we want to endorse all of our local, local peeps. Um, and then another one with sage and dessert to follow with lemon balm. Um, it's pork, rhubarb, skillet, and lemon balm and blackberry meringues. Now, oh, I hope everybody had dinner. Um, otherwise, I'm getting hungry. Um, here's some things. Now we move on to uh, making crafts and stuff. So it's so multifunctional. You've got the fun with design. So you great, get a great visual. It's helpful in landscaping. And then it's helpful with medicinal uses. And then your recipes. And now you can make stuff with it. I mean, you can't do that with, like, you know, I don't know, like geraniums. So. Um, they're good. Don't let me wrong. Dreams are fine. But these just are so multi-useful. And you what? <laughs> Somebody likes dreams. I'm sorry if I've got anybody that likes it. But here's some fun things about um, making the language with herbs. So, you know, it's got a whole new thing here with Angelica for inspiration. Basil means love or hate. Bay is victory, and I won't read them all, but sage for long life. So some of these, they have their their meanings, and you can make um, wreaths, soaps, oils, vinegars, lotions, um, and mussy tussies. These are mussy, mussy tussies, and you can make them with coordination with what, you know, what they mean. So when you give it to somebody, um, and let's say you want to incorporate, let's say, like, like tarragon, then it could be lasting relationships, and it's like, oh, you know, and it's kind of, kind of heady, but anyway. Move on to herbal soaps. Here's a fun recipe for herbal soaps. It's really easy to make. It just takes a little time, but you can see it turns out just beautiful. And then we have lavender wands, which you can go online. And of course, herbal soaps and lavender wands. There's always a YouTube for everything. You know, I'm surprised they don't have how to wash your hair on, on, on YouTube. So, I mean, everything possible they have on, on YouTube. Um, herbal wreaths. There's some beautiful herbal wreaths that you can incorporate. And then use those wreaths in your house, in your kitchen, and just pick off part of the you know, wreath for your, for your use. They make wonderful Christmas gifts. And they're great for Thanksgiving, um, not only on the wall, but uh, on your table. Um, so it's really, really fun. Now, it makes great oils and vinegars. Here's a Tuscan herb olive oil recipe. And then, a little something you might not have known is love potions. 
So come, come uh, February, when the, the snow has thawed, you can uh, make, a, make a little love, love potion or something. But um, put that aside. But so on that note, I will love you and leave you. And uh, so now you're newly inspired with herbs and how to grow them and how to use your garden completely. And um, so thank you. Best to you on your new adventures with herbs. You can see me on part two at MOA. And so this, this is kind of a funny little guy. It says, and finally some burlap. Ned puts the garden to bed. <laughs> so um, any questions you might have, um, you can let me know now, or you can just jot down um, uh, information that you want to have. Uh, I'll answer it via email. Um, whatever you feel like doing. Um, I want to put a plug in for the Herb Society of America. I brought on some information for membership. There's so many benefits to membership. It's just crazy. There's, for one, just reciprocity to a lot of the local gardens like Chicago Botanic. You get in for free, which is really huge. Um, and then, oops. And then um, this is Nina Ridgeway's uh, card that she has. Uh, gives her hours that her Bartell fruit farm is open. Um, and then I've got my cards here. There's a bountiful uh, things that you can look online about herbs, um, along with reviewing the, uh, the video that we have here. Um, this cookbook is put out by the Herb Society of America. Uh, this is not a paid advertisement. I just love this group. They, they are a group of excited, very enthusiastic, ambitious women. I just can't get over how productive they are. And um, in some groups, there's maybe 20 to 30 percent participation. I think it's probably close to 90 percent participation. They just all have a lot of fun. And they have their, um, their herb sale at Warner every year in May. They have a just, I mean, a lot of, I won't let the secret out of the bag, but it's great. Um, and then this, if you want to get started on herbs, is the Herb Quarterly. So um, that would be a good magazine just to start with. It's very simple, very comprehensive. Of course, there's various different books. Um, landscape design books and different things. Um, um, herbal Goddess. Don't get an oppression here. <laughs> no, just not, I'm just kidding. Um, and then there's other, um, there's other books, and this is a fascinating book. Gosh, this book is made, is, is um, written by a woman that works with Dr. Andrew Weil, and he's just an amazing guy. If you ever want to go online, he's been like just everywhere on Oprah. So that's huge, you know, been on Oprah. Um, but he's really an intelligent man. Um, but anyway, Rosemary Glasgow, Herbal Recipes, really in depth stuff. It's really a really good book too. So anyway, that is about it. So I hope you enjoyed this presentation and I hope you really are enthused about getting on um, making things in your garden. If there's any questions, have I just answered everything that you might possibly need? Yes. Some herbs are perennials and some are annuals. you want to touch a little bit on that? Oh yeah, we want to talk about perennial herbs and annual herbs. Well, there it, in Wisconsin, there's not a lot of perennial herbs. Um, they do have some. Um, now further south, there might be more options, but here we have, um, I don't think I have any perennial herbs here. These are all, these are all annual herbs. The chives, so chives, the rosemary. Chives, chives, chives. chives is perennial. Yeah, shout it out. Chives, thyme, that's perennial. Tarragon, sage. Mint, oh yeah, mint. So we've got a lot of experienced people. So we have a handful yes, of different herbs, and also like for instance, thyme. You can play with thyme because you've got some variegated thyme. You've got the regular common thyme, which is more, um, it's more reliable. Some of the other varieties are a little touch and go. I've grown um, lemon scented thyme, and that's come back for me about you know three years, and it sort of poofs out. Um, but that's, that's fun. You've got the, uh, yeah, lavender. That, that's sort of, a, that's a sore subject with me. <laughs> we have this love-hate relationship. I'm still working on it. 
I'll get it. Um, but lavender is supposed to be a perennial. Um, and then finding um, really good sources for your, um, see ya. Thanks for coming. Um, another board person, oh no, they're dropping like flies. <laughs> Wake up out there or no? Um, they, your sources like the flower source is really good. Um, Nina Ridgeway's uh, Bartel, she has a lot of good healthy herbs. Um, Manchas Farms, uh, Millingers, there's some really good sources and a lot of good people to help you out there. So there are a few perennial herbs that I would mix in um, with your perennial garden um, or have them you know, mixed in your bed for herbs um, that will show off most of the year with that. Any other questions? Yes? Oh, ornamental basil. Well, usually most you do, but when they say ornamental, that kind of means maybe not. It comes back every year in my garden. Oh, good. Do you like it? No. No. Oh, not so ornamental. Oh, okay. I've heard of ornamental oregano, and that's really beautiful. It doesn't quite look like... Uh, you can, um, but I, I can't recommend when it says ornamental, then, you know, I would check, you know, not... Um, I mean, where did you buy it? This is at Science. Science? You know, they've got some good missing. Ornamental basil, really. I, I don't, don't eat it. Don't eat it. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Well, because it's ornamental. You know, that's the, the big draw. But, um, you know, this is considered kind of ornamental because it's variegated, but it's very good to eat. So I always stay away from things that are classified strictly as ornamental. What do you guys think, the panel of experts over there? Ornamental? No? No? The vote's in? No. <laughs> well, it depends on if you don't want it or not. Leave a little bit or just put it in, you know, the ground with some, in a cement cage. You know. Oh, well, if you don't like it. There's so many other wonderful things. Just have diversity. Yes, we have a question. Um, yes, we have sweet potato vines. Oh, yeah. When I went to check it out like a week ago at the farmer's market, I pulled up a huge sweet potato. But really? And I cleaned it up, and it's in my basket of fall produce, but I don't know how to, oh. what to do with it. Oh, how about you that? Eat it? You know, I, I know the sweet potato. Uh, has, you know, it's fine, just like squash and stuff, but I would think if it was grown for an annual and specifically for that, it might just be, you know, the fruit that comes of it. I, I would say not. Yeah. What do you think, panel? Up? Down? You're not paying attention. Hey. Hey. <laughs> Sweet potato vine produces a potato. Would you eat it? Not eat it. Not eat it. Okay. Yeah. Good question. Boy, these are tough. Oh, oh, one more question. Okay. Um, I have a eucalyptus plant. Yes. How would I turn that into like like some like a bath thing where you could use the leaves in your bathroom to dry it out for us? Um, you know, eucalyptus fresh or dried, it kind of retains its its you know oils. Um, and that's that's something you could go online to get more of a lengthy explanation. But it's a neat plant. It's an annual, of course, and use it for reeds and stuff or to clip it um, for your just general use in dry flower arrangements. But go online if you want to use it in the bath. Um, it's very, um, you know, it's, it's very stimulating. It's for like sore muscles and things like that. Good for when you have a cold. And so it opens up the passageways. Um, but there's enough information that's longer than I could, you know, have time for here. But yeah, that's nice. I love it when people try different and new things because eucalyptus you can't really find anywhere. I know Manchus has eucalyptus. Paradise Gardens. Paradise Gardens, they're a good source too. They're right on 33. Yeah, yeah, right, they're really good. Any further questions? I have rosemary and thyme and sage. Uh huh. Well, being annual, they'll probably just die. So there's nothing you could do unless you dig them out and put them in your house. Now, thyme is more of a perennial, so that'll stay. Um, I just kind of, um, some people clip it back. I just leave it. You can, you can put um, pine boughs over them, the 
because um, a lot of times the, the way you keep plants from dying in the winter, it doesn't necessarily keep them as If you get some good winter cover, then you're good, but you never can predict that. But putting uh, some pine boughs on top of that will help um, kind of regulate the um, temperature of the soil. So when the soil thaws and you know heaves and thaws, it, that's what kills the plants, is when it pushes up the, the soil and then your plant gets all like burned out and dies because you don't put the proper cover on it. But uh, rosemary is an annual, so if you want to keep it, I'd pull it out of the ground, put it in a pot, and put it in your kitchen or your house right window. Um, thyme is a perennial, uh, sage is a perennial. Um, both, all of them are pretty self-sufficient. You don't want to cover them too much because then it'll retain too much water. And you know, so I'd experiment. Depends on this, your your area of your garden. If it's um, sunny and light, and the soil is light, um, and you get a good winter cover, then I just leave it. If you if you want to try half and half, I I'm not there in your garden, so I don't know the environment that it has. But try covering one side and leaving the other and see what happens. Because we all want to keep the garden going as long as we can. I think you had that continued continue question. You have the turquoise blonde hair. Did you have any further questions? OK, I don't want to miss you. Anybody else? Yes? If you don't cook with them, mm -hmm. is it like worth planting them? <gasps> oh! <laughs> the question was, if you don't cook with them, is it worth planting them? Have you been listening to the <laughs> seminar? <laughs> No, no, it is. For the fragrance. You know, there's a, yeah, there's a lot of wonderful things. If you don't want to use for cooking, you know, just ornamentally, it's really cool. And then you can walk by it and have a relationship with them. But you know, it's nice. And medicinally, you can make tea. Like basil tea is really good, and it's great for you medicinally. Or if you're crafty, um, growing rosemary makes a beautiful wreath. You know, you can put that in your dried flower arrangement. So it's a very valid point because some people, you know, they either have their husbands cook and their husbands would just rather grill everything and they don't <laughs> use herbs. Okay, well, and then, um, or you're too busy to cook. So to grow herbs is very, it's very meditative um, and you could have a wonderful herb garden um, despite the fact that if you don't want to use the herbs, give it to your neighbors. They'll, yeah, I'll, I'll take, you know, take my number down, call me, <laughs> if you want to not have them for your cooking, but thank you for that question. Yes, we have a kiss in the back. I wouldn't, no, um, herbal oils are generally used for medicinal, um, so the question was, are herbal oils good in cooking, and um, no. I wouldn't use herbal oils in cooking. They're just too, too, too intense. They can't. It changes the whole composition and the oil of float or whatever. It is. You just. It's not recommended. They're not for that. And some herbs that are oils aren't even edible. So it's a lot of it is more topical. And so. Yeah. Oh. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, they can be pretty decoration. You can put them in your hand soap, or, well, you can put a little on your, like, on hand soap, to make, like if she has lavender oil or something. Um, yes, you're indicating uh, your temples. You can use lavender oil to relieve headaches, to have just relaxation, like I doused myself before the lecture in lavender, so I feel like I'm not tense. But, um, and, and that works. Oh, my goodness, lavender. Yeah. Really, very relaxing. It really does work, but um, I don't know what oils you have. But mostly, um, the oils could be used topically. I'd get like a neutral uh, lotion. You can put just a couple of drops in there, because if you use too many, you might get a rash or reaction. But um, a mint, okay. A mint is good for headaches. Um, so you can put them on the temple. It's a very stimulating herb, but it's it's good for that, and it's good for smelling too. If you have one of those um, those diffusers, those new fangles um, diffusers, go online and see what combinations that you can put with. There's like you put 
water in there and a few drops of mint or whatever, and then you're going to have this wonderful smell in your house. So your wife was wise in, in getting a lot of unusual, you know, like the, the oils. So she, well, she got it as a gift to us. That's been a little, little Isn't that neat what they come up with? Mm -hmm. I didn't know what to do with it. <laughs> yes, and they're very expensive, so don't throw it out. <laughs> but look online. Align Online has so many things that you can use those oils for, mostly topical. I would not use them for cooking at all. Yeah. Did you, did you have a question? I just have a thing. So the lady in the pond doesn't know what to do with some of those. Put out and get rid of some of these animals that are Oh yeah, so so yeah, so you're suggesting to put different herbs in place of Oh, isn't that ever good? Yeah, so if you're not using them for cooking, use it to deter like um, deer. So I'm always, you know, me and my neighbor Pat, we're always looking for ways to deter the deer. We love them, but we don't necessarily want them to have a gourmet lunch on our stuff. So putting um, chives around your plants helps. Uh, I've been using um, soap. I use um, the uh, Irish Spring. That works for me, putting it around. And I see the deer out there bathing and, you know, <laughs> bubbles are flying. Oh, it's frenzy. But uh, any other questions? Is that good? All right, good. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate you coming. Boy, we're out on time. How about that? Woo. Thanks, Jimmy. Thank you guys for all.